Lord Jesus, you're the center of it all. Enthroned at the center of our hearts as believers, as Christians, as those who trust in you and love you. Father, in our church, you're enthroned in our praises, in our studies, in our fellowship. Lord, I pray that every single believer, every single person within the sound of my voice this morning will understand what that means to be enthroned, to be enthroned in everything. Lord Jesus, you are the sovereign Lord and creator of the universe. And help each and every one of us to bow our hearts, to bow our life, to bow our church, to bow everything before you, Lord, in humble adoration. Lord Jesus, we love you. We praise you. Thank you, Father, for this time of worship. Thank you for this time of refreshing. Father, thank you for your presence and your power and your glory in our midst. Lord, let every heart know and feel that, Father. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. All God's people said, amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Great to see everyone this morning. Hope everyone's doing well. And if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and Stephanie will bring you one. Thank you, Paul. Um, boy, it's been a tough week. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit later, you know, about some, our, our response to Ukraine. But as we opened up service this morning, praying for the country of Ukraine, let's, let's not just pray for them on Sunday morning, family. Let's pray for them every day. Let's pray for the Christians that they get their, that their ministry, doors of ministry are opened up. We're going to be talking about this one, open doors of ministry. But also pray for all the innocent people that are fleeing the country. And um, I'm sure you've seen this stuff on TV. It's very sad. But what can, what can you do? We can go before the Most High God and intercede and pray for them. Amen? Amen. So it's great to see you guys. Turning your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. We're looking at verses 7 through 13. Remember, we're studying each church, one church per Sunday. And today we come to the church at Philadelphia. The church at Philadelphia. So, uh, I guess I better turn my Bible there too. Revelation uh, chapter 3. Let's look at verses um, 7 through 9. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 9. And it says, And to the angel at the church at Philadelphia write, He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and he who shuts and no one opens, it says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but a lie, but lie, excuse me, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. Father, as we look at it, build us up, strengthen us, encourage us, challenge us, and equip us by your spirit this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. So this morning we're looking at the sixth church, the church at Philadelphia. Philadelphia was known as the faithful church. Praise the Lord. Uh, I think it was Philadelphia and, and Smyrna were the two churches that uh, Jesus had nothing negative to say. It was all positive. It was all encouraging. So praise the Lord for that. Little is known about the historical background of the church at Philadelphia. It was founded in 190 BC by King Humanes of Pergamum, which was the ancient capital back in that day. The church, the church there was likely founded by Paul during his second missionary journey in Acts chapter 19. If you go back to Acts chapter 19, it says that Paul spent two years in Ephesus, and many scholars believe that it was during that two-year stay in Ephesus that he established the, uh, the churches there in Asia Minor, many of them there, anyway. The name Philadelphia, it comes from two words. Philo means to love, and Adelphos means a brother. Thus we have the city of Praise the Lord. Yeah, man, y'all are good this morning. Man, y'all make, y'all make preaching fun. <laughs> uh, but the city of brotherly love. What a, what a, what a great title. You know, our, the, we have a city here in our country called Philadelphia. 
But if you know anything about their sports fans, you wouldn't know that um, they're a city of brotherly love. <laughs> but, uh, but no, but seriously, it, it, it is the city of brotherly love. And um, nothing against my, my Philly fans, uh, Eagles or Steelers fans. I love you. You love me. We're all good. But uh, Christ has no concerns for this church. He, he has praises and, and he commends them. So this morning, let's dive into the, let's dissect and let's look closely at the church of Philadelphia and let's look at what we can learn. Now, as we study this, I'm going to be using the phrase a lot about the faithful church, the faithful church, but also translate that into faithful Christian, faithful Christian. So as we see these things, think about how you, on a, uh, in your uh, individual walk with Christ, how you can apply these truths to your life. Amen? Amen. Let's look at it. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, he who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut. Uh, and who shuts and no one opens says this. i got to stop right there because we got to look at these three awesome titles that the Lord Jesus Christ has been given. And in the book of Revelation alone, there are over 50 titles given to Jesus. And in this one verse that we just read, three titles are given to him. Let's look at them. First one, it says in verse seven, it says, he who is holy, he who is holy. In the Old Testament, this phrase holy was a designation for Yahweh. It was a designation for Yahweh, Jehovah. Isaiah chapter six, verse three says, and one called out to another and they said, holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now that phrase holy, it means to be separate. And what is God separate from? God is separate from sin. He's pure, he's perfect, he's righteous, he's never done wrong, and he's without sin. He is holy. And as we speak right now, at this very moment, as you're inhaling that breath into your lungs, there is a place above called the third heaven. The New Jerusalem. We're going to get to that at the end of this passage. But within the city of that New Jerusalem, there is a throne. And God the Father is seated on the center of that throne. And the Lord Jesus Christ is seated at his right hand. And, and the Bible says in Revelation chapter 4, the angels surround the throne. And they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And encircled upon that circle, not only is the Father but it's the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. What an amazing title. So the number one, the first title in that verse is he is holy. Look at the second one. It says, he who is true. Everybody's favorite Bible verse, John 14, 6. I, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus is the true and living God, okay? He's true. That means he's not a lie, okay? Jesus is not a myth. Jesus is not made up. Jesus is true. When he says, I am the way, the truth, the life, no one comes to the Father but me, he's declaring his truth. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 8, this, this truth is so empirical that nothing can be done against it. But, we can, but only we can support the truth. He's faithful to all of his promises. He is completely trustworthy. Friends and family, you can completely surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't surrender your life to Calvary Chapel. Don't surrender your life to your church. Don't surrender your life to your pastor. Surrender your life to the mighty hand, the Lord Jesus Christ, because he is true. He's not a fairy tale. He's not a fable. He is reality. Matter of fact, if you go look at the word truth in the dictionary, it'll say that which conforms to reality. What an amazing truth. He will not disappoint you. He is the real deal, okay? And if you have Christ, you have everything because he is truth. He's more truth than, than reality ourselves. He is the definition of truth. He upholds the universe by his mighty right hand. That's why he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. You can trust him. And, and, and not only is he the truth, but he loves you. He loves you. Jesus loves us. Jesus loves you. This we know, for the Bible tells us so. 
That is truth. He loves the rebel. He loves the saint. Think about that for a minute. Think about the thief on the cross who had lived a life of rebellion. And in his final hours, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he says, today you will be with me in paradise. All it takes is us to turn our hearts towards him and live for him because he is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. Jesus is not your religion. He's not my religion. He is the true and living God. And look at the third one. This is a really fascinating one. In verse seven, he says, uh, he who has the key of David. What's up with that? The key of David. How many, how many of you guys ever heard of the key of David? This phrase, the key of David, in verse 7, it takes us back to Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, in Isaiah chapter 22, uh, verse 22, where it says, Then I will set the keys of the house of David on his shoulder, and when he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. Eliakim kept the keys of the kingdom back in his day. Eliakim controlled access to all the doors and all the treasures in the kingdom, okay? He was the key. He was the guy with the, the ring and all the keys hanging on his side. And when he opened a door, it was open. But when he closed the door, it was closed. So he was the ancient keeper of the keys that kept all the treasures and all the valuable things there in Jerusalem locked away and, and kept locked up so people couldn't break into them. Today, 2022, Jesus holds the keys to everything in the Father's kingdom. Let me repeat that. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Alpha and the Omega, he holds the keys to everything in the Father's kingdom. Jesus unlocks the treasures of heaven and makes them available to us when we trust him. He opens the door. He opens the door to God's treasures. What are God's treasures? Uh, he opens the door to the God's storehouse of, of mercy and forgiveness. Have you experienced God's mercy and forgiveness? Have you experienced Jesus opening that door and, sh and showing you mercy and showing you forgiveness? See, if you're like me, man, I was a rebel. I was a rebel before I came to Christ. And my sin debt was high. I mean, it was long and it was deep and the list went for miles and miles. But when I came to Christ, he opened up that door, that treasure of mercy and forgiveness, and he displayed it to me at the cross. And it's unlimited. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how far a person has gone. It doesn't matter how far a, a, a person is, is in chains or how far a person has gone into sin and rebellion. Or even if they've lived their whole life in rebellion. If they'll put their trust in Christ before their final breath, he will open up the treasures of the storeroom of mercy and forgiveness and display it to us. That is awesome. He opens the door to God's deliverance and to God's healing. You know, when we come to Christ, that's another door he opens up, is deliverance and healing. You know, when we first come to Christ, a lot of times we don't have it all together. You know, we first come to church, we, we give our lives to Christ, we surrender to him, we start believing in him, we start trusting in him, but we come with some baggage. Anybody here ever come with any baggage? I came with a lot of baggage. I, I came with a lot of stuff I had to deal with. But through discipleship, through trusting in Christ, through continuing in the faith, Christ opened up that door of deliverance and healing, okay? He delivered me from bondage. He delivered me from things I was addicted to. He delivered me from things that I struggled with and I wrestled with. And he's brought me to a place of victory. And then healing. A lot of times when we think about healing, we think about physical healing. And I do believe in physical healing. But I believe healing is much more in physical healing. It's spiritual healing. It's emotional healing. It's healing in our minds. It's, 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 the, it's the whole entire picture. I believe as a person comes to Christ, he can heal you physically, emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. And how many of you guys know the day and age we're living in, it's getting tough mentally. It's getting tough, especially if you're watching a lot of social media and a lot of TV, which I, I just want to say as your pastor, man, cut that stuff off. You know, read the news, figure out what's going on in the world, and then shut that stuff off. 
Because it can drain you mentally. It can hurt you psychologically. And, but God can restore that. The, the, another door that um, Jesus controls the key to and he opens up when you trust in him is his power and his love. His power and his love. When I came to Christ, all the hate melted. You know, God showed me his love displayed at the cross, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrates his own love for us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And not only did he show me his love, but he imparted his love to me, and he gave me a love for all people, okay? That's, that's, the, that's the treasure of heaven. That's the key that, that the Lord Jesus Christ opens up in God's kingdom so that we can experience his love and his power. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So he opens up the key, the doorway, the, the storehouse of God's power when we trust in the cross. You see, before I came to Christ, I had no power in and of myself. I had no way, no ability to find freedom from the things that I was enslaved to. But when I came to Christ and he gave me his Holy Spirit and he gave me the power, he gave me the power to overcome and to be a witness. How about this one? He opens the door. He opens the uh, storehouse of the Holy Spirit. You know, when we, when we, before we come to Christ, according to Ephesians chapter two, you and I were dead in our sins. We were dry. Our, our, the inside of us was, was empty just a dead, dry heart. But when you come to Christ, he opens up the, the gate and he pours out his Holy Spirit in our life. In other words, when you come to Christ, there is a spiritual transaction that takes place in our life. He fills you with the Holy Spirit. Family, if you're believing in Christ, man, if you could look inside your, your spiritual person, the Holy Spirit is dwelling in there. God is dwelling on the inside. And, he, and he's continually pouring out his spirit in our lives, leading us, guiding us. Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Are you thirsty? You know, even after we become a believer, and we're serving Christ, and we're filled with the Holy Spirit, there are seasons in our life where we'll feel dry, where we'll feel like our, our tank is low. And if you feel like you're in that dry season, if you feel like your tank is low, what do you need to do? You need to go to Christ and let him fill you afresh and anew with living water. With, with living water. He says, come to me and drink. You know, when I, when I think about wanting more of the Spirit in my life and wanting to be in more submission and more surrender. I think about getting into the Word, spending some time reading some passages of Scripture. I think about prayer. I think about, you know, just being alone with Him. I think about worship music. You know, there's something powerful <clears throat> in worship music where going down the road, in your closet, in your office, in your home, where you're just worshiping the Lord. And I believe through that prayer, through that worship, through that Bible reading, that God is doing surgery on our heart and he's opening up our hearts so that we can be more yielded to the Holy Spirit and so that we can experience that living water. Not dead water, as we're going to talk about next week at the church at Laodicea, but living water, refreshing water. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He refreshes you, okay? We need times of refreshing. We need times to be renewed, you know, that's very important. And God does that by the Holy Spirit, by the Lord Jesus Christ opening up. The one who has the key, he's the one that unlocks it, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's continue. Look at verse 8. And as we go through the rest of these verses, I, I want to talk about, I want to give you six characteristics this morning. Six take-homes, six characteristics of a faithful church. So let's look at verse 8. And, as I, as we, and again, as we talk about faithful church, think about your own life. He says in verse 8, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. This, family, is what the Lord Jesus Christ does. Look at verse 8. I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. 
The Lord Jesus Christ, being a Christian and following and serving Christ, he will open doors in your life. And then he will close doors. Let's look at some, let's look at some other verses. This is a fascinating subject. Go to Bible Gateway, do a keyword search for open doors and closed doors. You see it a lot in the New Testament. Let's look at a couple of them. Uh, Acts chapter 14, verse 27 says, And when they had arrived and gathered the church, gathered the church together, they began to report all the things that God had done with them and how he had, there it is, opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. So the Jewish believers saw in the first century that God was opening a door for them to step out and take the gospel to the Gentiles, okay? So we need to be praying, God, please open doors in my life so I can reach out to others and share the gospel, okay? And we we need to look, we need to pray for that, we need to look for those doors And when he gives you a door, he'll let you know. Step through and share. It could be someone going through a difficult situation. It could be someone asking you for prayer. It could be someone that you're forming a close relationship with at work that that you you can share the gospel with. But God opens doors, okay? God opens doors for Christians to go out and share the gospel. So moving forward, look for open doors, Look for opportunities, family, to reach out and to share Christ with others. Another one is Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. Colossians 4, 3 says, Praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned. Again, Paul is talking here about an opportunity Um, that God is opening up for a doorway to step through to minister to other people. But I want you to look at the very first word up there. He says, praying. Praying at the same time for us as well. I believe this can be a very appropriate prayer in our prayer closet. That We should be able to pray this as Christians. Is Lord Jesus, please open the door. Please open doors for me, God, and show me what doors to step through. And Father, I also pray that you, you open doors in my life for opportunity, for life, to do God's will. But also, we pray, God, shut the doors you don't want me to go through. And man, that, that prayer for me is sometimes even greater. Because in life, there's lots of opportunities. You have lots of opportunities. You can go left, you can go straight, you can go right, you'll have three or four opportunities. So I think it's very appropriate for us as believers, according to Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, where that first word says, praying, I think it's very appropriate that we pray, Lord, if you don't want me to do this, please shut the door. It could be a job opportunity, it could be a big decision uh, for family, it could be any, it could be any, any numerous, numerous things, but we need to pray. We need to say, God, please open doors and shut doors. I think that's a very biblical prayer. The next one, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. This one's huge. It says, for a wide door for effective service has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. He says, a wide door. In other words, Paul's saying, this is a huge opportunity for effective service. Paul sees this opportunity where he's, he's taking the gospel to the Gentile world and he's saying that, man, I'm going to get to share the gospel with a lot of people. And I'm, I'm going to get to establish churches in new places. But look at the very last word. But there are many adversaries. Keep in mind that as God opens doors in your life for ministry, it will not always be smooth. There can be adversaries, okay? We have an enemy. His name is the devil, okay? And it could be the devil. It could be the world. It could be bad influences. But understand, just because God is leading you to step through a doorway and go in a certain direction that you won't face opposition. We do experience, as he says there, 
Uh, for a wide door for effective service is open to me, and there are many adversaries. There can be adversaries to stepping through um, the doors that God's open. You know what I'm saying? If you start talking about reaching out to the lost and sharing the gospel and doing great things for the kingdom of God, Satan and his minions do not like that. And you should expect spiritual warfare, okay? We should expect spiritual warfare when we, are, when we are doing God's will. Before I came to Christ, there was no spiritual warfare. There was nothing. I was serving Satan. I was serving my flesh. And I was doing my own thing. And there was no war. But when I started serving Christ and I started going in the direction that he was leading me, it was then I started facing adversaries. You will face adversity in serving Christ. But we just got to stay the course and keep our eyes on the prize. So the first, the first characteristic I present to you this morning of a faithful church is this. They step through the doors that God opens for them. Okay? And you could say that for yourself. As, as a Christian, uh, we, you, we step through the doors that God opens. You know, sometimes... You just, you just got, like I, like I say, like when I'm getting into the water, like I'm on the edge of a swimming pool, just, just take a step of faith. Sink or swim, I'm jumping in. You know what, God's got this, God's got me. But sometimes we just have to take a step of faith. We got to take a step of faith. You know what, and if, we, if we slip, if we fall, God will pick us up. But let's be people that step out and, and step out in faith. And re remember this. If Jesus opens a door, no man can shut it. No man can. If Jesus opens the door, the world, the world can't do nothing. Okay? But if, and if Jesus closes the door, no man can open it. Are you stepping through those doors? You know, pray. Friends and family, pray. Say, Lord, what do you want me to do from here? Where do you want me to go? Where do you want me to live? Where do you want me to serve in my church? What, do you, what, do you want, what are you asking me to do, Lord? What type of ministry are you, st or you want me to step out? And when he shows you, man, just sink or swim, jump in, step out in faith. And then he says in verse 8, let's go back to verse 8. I'm really uh, breaking verse 8 down. I'm, I'm actually going to get four, uh, four characteristics of a faithful church from this one verse. He's, the second thing he says in verse 8, he says, because you have little power. Because you have little power. Yeah, right there in the middle, because you have little power. The second characteristic of a faithful church is this. They understand in their own strength they are powerless in and of themselves. And therefore, they trust in the power of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Do you see what 2 Corinthians 12, 9 is saying? He's saying that uh, God's power is perfected in our weakness. You know that old saying that we learned as a child? When I am weak, he is, he is strong. He is strong. See, we don't trust in our own power. We don't trust in our own strength. We don't trust in our own schemes. We don't trust in our own thinking. We look to God. We look to God for our power. We look to God for our strength. We look to, 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 to God to show us how frail and weak we are in and of ourselves so that Christ and the Holy Spirit can be magnified and display their strength to the world. That's what he's talking about. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Paul is saying, man, I am weak. I am feeble. I can't do this. But Christ is strong. Christ is mighty. And Christ can do what he plans for our life. When we are weak, he is strong. When we are frail, he is mighty. Look at the next part of verse 8. He says, he's talking to this faithful church, man. He's just, he's just heaping praises on them. 
He's just like, guys, keep it up. Man, you're doing a great job. I'm so proud of you. But he says, and they have kept my word. The third characteristic of a faithful church is they are committed to the scriptures. The, a faithful church is committed to the word of God. They believe in the authority and the inspiration of the scriptures. Okay? We cling to God's word like nobody's business. It is our heart. It is our passion. It is our desire. It is our communication from heaven. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is theonostos. It's breathed out by God. So we, we, look at, we look at the Bible, and the Lord is just speaking to us. He's directing us. He's leading us. He's guiding us. And the Word of God, family, has to be at the center of church life, okay? We keep the, we keep the Word at the center. We, we, we will be just fine. But it's when the church removes the Scriptures and removes the foundation that the Bible lays that things began to deteriorate, okay? I can't stress that enough, man. Family, brothers, sisters, keep your life according to the word of God and you will make it. It will be your sure foundation. Vice versa, I, I warn you, if you get away from the word of God, your life will deteriorate. Life, your morals will crumble your faith will, will, will dry up. When we remove the Bible from being at the center of church life and the Christian's life, everything collapses. Man, I want you guys to succeed. I want you guys to succeed in life, in serving Christ. And the most important thing I can share with you in, in, in that aspect of life is stay in the word. Stay in the word. Love this word and build your life upon it. So that's the third characteristic, is they are deeply committed to the word of God. And the next one, the next part of verse, verse 8, we're still in verse 8. It says, and they have not denied my name. The fourth characteristic of a faithful church is they are loyal to Christ. They, they are loyal to his word. In other words, Christ is first. The word is, is, is first. So there has to be this deep loyalty, this deep commitment to Christ and his word. And you need to understand, in the first century, this cost many believers their life. Because in, in the secular world of their day, of the Roman Greco world, there was one Lord. There was one God. And his name was Caesar. So for a Christian in the first century... To confess Jesus as Lord, according to Romans chapter 10, verse 9, was a death sentence. Was a death sentence. But they did not care. They had found forgiveness of sin. They had found eternal life. They had found the one who washed all their sins away. They had found the one who had given them a new heart. And they wouldn't exchange that for nothing because Jesus was enthroned upon their hearts and they loved him and it says in there in verse, uh, verse 8 the very end of the verse 8 and it says they would not deny his name family if we do these things I'm going to give you two more we're going to speed it up here in a second but if, if we do these things you know if we step through doors that God opens if we trust in his power, understanding we are weak, if, if we are committed to the scriptures and we are loyal to Christ, we, family, position ourselves to be used mightily by the Lord, okay? It's not rocket science. Just simply do these foundational principles in the scripture, and it sets us up for success in the area of ministry, is just following the blueprint. Let's continue. Verse 9. Verse 9, he says, Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, uh, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet. Man, that is a very strong statement by the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, 
He didn't, he didn't say he'll ask them. He didn't say he'll beseech them. What does he say? He says, I will make them. Here in verse 9, Jesus is, says, I will humiliate your enemies, church. I will humiliate your enemies. And your enemies will come and bow down before you to, to show of his love. You know, the, the person that comes to mind when I think about this, does anybody, anybody, in your, anybody come to your mind from the book of Acts that was hating the church? Yeah, Paul. Uh, just ask the apostle Paul who wrote most of the New Testament. Acts chapter 9 verse 1 says, Paul was breathing out murderous threats against the disciples. He hated the church. He wanted to put them in prison. He wanted to kill them. Then on the road to Damascus, Paul the hater of Christians sees that bright, blinding light and he gets radically saved. And he turns his life and he surrenders his life to Christ. And what does Paul do with the rest of his life? Paul spends the rest of his life in humble submission, in service to the body of Christ. He went from hating Jesus to bowing and serving the body of Christ. That, my friend, is the power of God. You know, the Bible says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Do you understand the implication of that statement? That means people will not have a choice. They will bow their knee to the Son of God. They will bow. Every, the Bible says every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Let's bow our knees, family, in this life before the Son of God. And then notice he says, um, let's look at the second half of the verse. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and, and, and make them know that I have loved you. You know, I love that statement. Again, it, the, the text reminds us that, that Jesus loves us. God is saying it is through Christians he shows the ungodly world his great love for the body of Christ. So what do we need to do in light of of, of, of this, let's make sure to, that to all people, not just Christians, but to everyone in this life, that we show them grace, kindness, and truth, especially to those who oppose Christianity. We show them love. We show them kindness. We show them goodness. We, we make them meals. Man, Christians, there's no room for hate. There, there's no room for uh, being mean, Okay? We, we, we want to show them. And, and what happens is when we show them love, the world turns around and looks at us and says, wow, they've experienced a true love, the love of Christ. Verse 10. Verse 10, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to cut this. I'm going to cut verse 10 in half. He says, because you have kept the word of my perseverance. This word perseverance in verse 10 this is the third and final time perseverance is used here in Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3 to the seven messages of the seven churches. And perseverance is what? Perseverance is a call to commitment. It's a, it's a call to serve Christ long term. You know, we are not fickle. We're not on one day and off the, the next. We are committed in our lives to serving the Lord Jesus Christ, even in difficult times, even in trying times. So the fifth characteristic of a faithful church is they stay the course in difficult times. Perseverance, that word perseverance, it suggests trials and difficulty. But family, if we hold to Christ, it does not matter what we face, Christ will see us through every trial, every tribulation and persecution that comes our way. Second half of verse 10. Um, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, many, many scholars believe that the church at Philadelphia, the faithful church, and the church at Laodicea, which we're going to study next week, the lukewarm church, will possibly overlap in the last days. And if that is the case, this could be a reference to the rapture 
the, tribu- the rapture tribulation where Jesus raptures the faithful church prior to God's wrath being poured out in the great tribulation. In other words, Christ is going to return to this earth and he is going to remove believers that are trusting in him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, talking about the, um, the wrath of the great tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10 says, And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. What is the wrath to come talking about there? If you go study the passage, he's talking about the great tribulation. He's talking about this future time of wrath that we're going to be getting into once we get beyond. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, it says, after these things, after what these things? After the period of church, man, all hell is going to break loose. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 through Revelation chapter 20. Um, And then 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. One day, the Father will look to the Son and say, Jesus, it is showtime. And he's sending him back to planet Earth, and there's going to be a rapture where Christ calls his children home And then the world will go into a period called the Great Tribulation that we'll be studying here in in the weeks to come. Uh, So I find it interesting in verse 10 that I will keep you from the hour of testing. And as I was reflecting on that, that phrase, the hour of testing, you know, thinking about this being future uh, last days, I couldn't help but to think of the difficult day and age that we're living in right now, okay? Family, we, we, we live in difficult times today. It's very hard for us mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. The hearts, and probably many of you guys, sometimes my heart is, our hearts are heavy. Our minds are weighed down by everything that, that is taking place. It is hard to witness Everything we are seeing in our world is crazy. Just from the, the virus to, to Ukraine to politics, it can be very hard on the heart. It can be very difficult on the mind. The stress, the anxiety, the worry can be overwhelming. If that is you this morning, as I have been in that place before, I want to give you two words of encouragement if your heart and your mind is weighed down. Mine was this week. As I, as I see this tank running over this vehicle with this man inside of it, I'm like, what in the world is going on? This is crazy. And to see all the negative news and to see all the, the turmoil and, and all the crazy going on, it, it can be tough on our brains. It can be hard to watch and it can make us worry. I want to give you two words of encouragement this morning, if that is you. Number one, consume yourself in Christ. Consume yourself in Christ. What do I mean by that? What is, how, do, how do I consume myself in Christ? Spend lots and lots and lots and lots of time in the Word. Read your Bible daily, okay? Uh, you know, I'm not telling you morning, afternoon, or evening but I'm imploring each and every one of you this morning to spend some time reading the Bible. For some of you, that may be a, a chapter. For some of you, that may be just a passage or maybe a couple of verses. But whatever you do, carve out some time and spend some time in the Word. Spend some time praying. Spend some time praying, okay? You know, bow your head at home by your bedside at night, in the morning, in the afternoon, and spend some time with your Heavenly Father. Spend some time praying in your devotion, in your serving the Lord. And pray for the things that we see happening around us. Worship. Spend some time in worship. Put your earbuds in, listen to some Christian music, and and just let it take you away into worshiping the Lord. Fellowship. Man, we need fellowship today more than ever. You need 
what takes place in this building. You need what takes place in life groups. You need what takes place when a, just one or two brothers or a couple sisters get together for a cup of coffee at Starbucks just to have a quick conversation and have some fellowship. You need time with each other. A lot of times when we're alone and we're by ourselves, you know, I like to call them squirrels. Squirrels get into our head. You ever, get, you ever, had, you ever had a squirrel get in your head? A squirrel gets in your head? Or, or, or what's the little gerbil, the little wheel? And they, they call the gerbils. The gerbils go on the wheel and they, they just keep running. There's gerbils get in our head and they start running. And, and before you know it, our thought life gets out of control. And what we need are these things to counter that squirrel running around in our head. And we need fellowship. And, and we need encouragement. And along the way of the word, prayer, worship, and fellowship, be a witness. Share the love of Christ. Share Christ with others. So that's the first one. If you're, if you're wrestling, if you're like me, and you're wrestling with what you're seeing in the world, I want you to consume yourself in Christ. Secondly, this is, this is important. Limit your social media. Limit your social media and limit your news. I'm not saying don't be uninformed. You know, get up in the morning. If you, if you want to, you don't have to. <clears throat> or go to your, 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 your trusted website that you go to. Find out what's going on. Have a, understand what's going on. And then cut off social media. Cut off the local news. It, 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 won't, it won't take you to a good place. If you sit and you watch it all day long, it will only spiral you downwards. So let's do that, family. Let's consume ourselves with Christ and let's limit our social media and limit our news. And let, let's not be tested, per se, um, by what's going on in our world. But let's, instead of being worry-filled, let's be faith-filled. Let's be faith-filled and right above the circumstances because God is sovereign. God is in control. He knows exactly what's going on. And trust me, God has got trenches, excuse me, God has got Christians in the trenches of Ukraine at this very moment serving the people, okay? And God knows what's going on and God's gonna repay those who do evil, okay? He ain't gonna let nothing he ain't going to let nothing under the sun happen that he will not hold people accountable for. Amen? Yeah. All right, let's finish this up. Verse 11 and 12. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and uh, my new name. The sixth and final characteristic I present to you this morning from the church at Philadelphia is they live with an eternal perspective. We gotta live with an, with an eternal perspective. Our eyes have to be on heaven. We have to be heavenly minded. We have to view in this life Christ as our greatest reward. We have to be looking to the Lord Jesus Christ and keeping our hearts focused on what is eternal. It doesn't mean we're not doing things in this life and you know, going to college, working, helping, and, and doing all those things. But when it comes to spiritual matters, we keep our eyes on Christ. And we always remember the big picture. The big picture is up there. The little picture is down here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18 says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You know, this is temporary. This building is temporary. Your physical body is temporary but your soul is eternal. And we got to keep that in mind. Hey, what's up with this new Jerusalem? I love this subject, by the way. Wait till we get to Revelation chapter 20, verse 21. God is going to give us a detailed description of heaven. And i just give you a little heads up. It's 1,500 miles tall by wide. It's a perfect cube. 
that, that we, we're going to study in heaven. But he calls it the New Jerusalem. And this is actually the name of heaven. The Bible teaches, the scripture teaches there are three heavens. The first heaven is the atmosphere around the earth. When you walk out the building this morning, you take a look up, see some blue sky, see some cloud, might see a little bit of rain. All that's taking place in the first heaven. Then there's the second heaven. That's the universe. It's endless in every direction. If you got into, if you got into a space shuttle and went out into space, you'll never come to a brick wall. Okay? You'll never come to a brick wall. It's endless in every direction. That's what the scripture calls the second heaven. Psalms chapter 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. So we have the first heaven, second heaven. But the Bible says that there is a place called the third heaven. Jesus said in John chapter 14, he told his disciples on the evening before his crucifixion, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Listen to this. This is exact Jesus' words. I go to prepare a place. He says, I go to prepare a place. That Greek word for place in John chapter 14 is topos. And that the word topos in the Greek means a place marked off by boundaries, by geographical boundaries. So there is this place above. We don't know exactly where it's at. I wish I did, but we know it's up. It's, it's there. We are here. It is there. And this is what he's talking about here, this new Jerusalem. And we're going to see at the end of the book, of, at the end of Revelation, in the, when the kingdom comes, that this place called heaven is no longer going to be there. It's going to be here. Maybe the capital of the new earth. But wait till we get there. Go ahead and start reading ahead. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 21. But there's this place called the new Jerusalem. And this is an eternal city where the Lord Jesus Christ is right now at this very moment. Verse 13, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Family, in closing, be encouraged this morning in Christ. We don't find our encouragement from things that are going on in the world. They disappoint. But our hope, our strength, our joy... Our, even our excitement living in this day and age, it comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said in John chapter 3, you must be born again. The Bible says we are to examine ourselves, to make sure we're in the faith. So I ask you this morning, does everyone know that they've been born again? That they've received Christ as their Lord and Savior? That they've repented of their sins? they put their trust in Christ and, and he is their Lord. If you have done that, if you have been born again, you have this hope. You have the promises of, of, of the things that we talked about this morning. When it says Jesus uh, has the key of David, you can experience these things in full measure today. Amen? So if you haven't, please... For heaven's sake, for the Lord's sake, come talk to Pastor David. I will be glad to pray with you, to lead you in a prayer to Christ, to talk about the gospel, you know, or talk to another brother or sister and, and surrender your life to Christ. And we can ride above, ride above the turbulence of this world and serve Christ. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your word this morning, Father. Thank you for this faithful church at Philadelphia, Lord. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to serve you. Help us to love you. And help us to do these things that we've talked about, Father. Father, I pray that you would open up doors of opportunity for our church. For each and every believer here, Father. Each and every person within the sound of my voice. I pray a, a, just a, a special blessing over them this week that you would open up doors of opportunity for ministry. And Lord, maybe for some of us, you may shut a door. But Father, when you open that door and you shut that door, I pray that you will remind them of what you told the church here at Philadelphia. So Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.